the lead line, reminding you of your personal genius and how you think in order to actualize what you desire. Welcome again to Lead Live, a weekly Wednesday online show on effective leadership and mindset practices, highlighting diverse professionals who lead in public and private spaces from corporate, educational, and nonprofit organizations. Today, as we reflect on the pandemic and protest, I've asked uh, a remarkable man, uh, happens to be someone who's an extended family member, definitely a loved one, but most importantly for our audiences, uh, Brian Munro is a journalist, an American journalist who's spent his time making a difference, ensuring people have voice uh, in various spaces in this country as well as in other countries. He's currently associate professor of practice at Temple University Klein College of Media and Communication. Before joining Temple, Ryan was editor of CNN Politics and Washington Opinion Editor for CNN and president of the National Association of Black Journalists and editor-in-chief of Ebony and Jet magazines. <laughs> Some of us, uh, as I share with a few people who know Brian, they were recounting the fact that thanks to Brian's leadership, Obama had his first public uh, viewing in terms of running for the presidential election because of Brian, uh, Obama and his wife uh, in Ebony and Jet magazines. He was the last person to interview Michael Jackson. He's on a number of shows now, uh, online of course, uh, whether it is being interviewed by colleagues or individuals who are concerned about the nature of politics right now. So as we think about the pandemic and protests uh, that are happening, we're thinking about the business closures, the business openings, the fewer employment opportunities, the economic challenges. We're thinking about the uncertainty due to the fears, the harms uh, that are have been in, inflicted on individuals, uh, not only uh, the recent uh, uh, killing of George Floyd, but the whole notion of man's and humanity demand. The greater transparencies revealing certain truths that disproportionately affect black professionals, black or persons of color, women. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to highlight more of the differences among humans in ways that produce greater and shared understanding while revealing the extraordinary geniuses that we all have and the promise that we have to contribute to the betterment of our species. So as I bring on Brian Monroe, I want you to think about how we can recalibrate how we lead to build more solutions that advance our humanity, ensuring our effectiveness as leaders. So Brian, please thank you. Uh, my sincerest gratitude for you joining me today and joining all of us, the viewing audience. And uh, now I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself. So, Roy, thank you for bringing me, Brian. Honora, thank you for having me, uh, or as my kids call you, Auntie Tina. <laughs> uh, uh, really appreciate uh, allowing me to join your conversation. You know, we are indeed in some powerful times right now. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to imagine that this is just June, that 2020 is barely half over. And what, you know, we thought at the beginning of the year, the worst news of the year was going to be the passing of Kobe Bryant. And that seems like that's a lifetime ago um, with coronavirus and COVID and then uh, George Floyd and the uprisings coming out, out of that. Um, we are going through an inflection point in this country. And you know, certainly we in the media that try to document and cover this uh, are trying to bring you it as fast as we can, but it's still hard to make sense out of it all. Mm -hmm. So hopefully in this discussion, we can talk about how we do that and, and what sense needs to be made and how you can lead through these crises and um, turn the challenges into opportunities. Yes, challenges into opportunities. We hear that a lot, right? 
uh, whether it's our elders or whether it is uh, someone we work with, or even we find ourselves saying that to our children, uh, challenges are just a flip, uh, an opportunity waiting for us to take advantage of it. Can you explain why that whole statement is powerful and is meaningful, especially now? Well, you know, here's a very real world example. Um, I'm also the co-chair of an international organization called IWMF, the International Women's Media Foundation. Mm -hmm. We're champion women journalists from around the world and celebrate their courage and uh, adversity. Uh, and, and a lot of the women are, are, are what we call independent or freelance journalists. So they don't have a big ABC or CNN or New York Times or Associated Press supporting them. They're out there by themselves, living assignment to assignment. And as things have dried up during this economic crisis, mm. a lot of them have been, been struggling. Um, but at the same time, not just that group, but many other nonprofits, for instance, are finding sources of revenue drying up. Mm. And, but they still need to exist. And so, you know, finding the opportunities in that, uh, you know, for instance, if, if your organization relied on events and, you know, galas and things like that to raise money, nobody's gathering right now. Mm -hmm. State of New York, for instance, has a ban on and turned it into an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and that often can come, you know, one of the things this organization is doing is it is reaching out to some of their individual funders um, uh, whether it's Craig Newmark, the guy who created Craigslist, or um, uh, folks at Twitter, and ask them, rather than spend your money on sending people to this event, why don't we take that money and use it to create instant support for women journalists around the, the world? And we've seen that um, in the last few weeks, we've raised more than $2 million, $2.86 million, doing just that. Excellent. At the same time, where we're not going to have our annual fall gala event, mm -hmm. um, and so you know that's just one example of taking a challenge and flipping it. Excellent. Excellent, excellent, and that's a reflection of your legacy, and I know that um, up close. So again, it's an honor to have you on this lead live show. The first of the two questions I want to ask you is how to inspire integrity and in leadership to deal with matters described that we just mentioned above, uh, while addressing at least to neutralize the divisive politics within one's own organization. And I bring up politics, especially because of your uh, expertise in uh, journal in politics in terms of journalism. Yeah, I've covered every president since Jimmy Carter, I believe. Um, I was in junior high when he was president, so that doesn't really count. But uh, <laughs> um, but have have uh, either photographed or interviewed um, uh, every president. I remember covering Ronald Reagan when he was doing an event in Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. and there's the TV Ronald Reagan versus the real life Ronald Reagan. TV Ronald Reagan is very smiley and energetic, and I remember this event was at the Warehouser Lumberyard. And he, the limo pulled up, he got out, and he looked like, you know, how old was he, 77 years old? Um, in his late 70s, and he looked it. Um, mm. The car was kind of hunched over and getting, and as soon as he got to the microphone, it's like someone took a steel rod and shoved it up his back. Mm -hmm. Straightened up, the face came, the smile opened up, his eyes got bright, and the TV Ronald Reagan was right there. Mm. As as the cameras were off, and they came back down, and Kind of slipped over, but you know that was his. That was one of his mechanisms on fostering belief in his personality around him. Hmm. Uh, and so you asked about politics. You know that's that's obviously national politics, but organization politics are, are similar. Some people use it as a bad word. Organizational hmm. politics hmm. It really doesn't have to be. What it really is is the ability to persuade, to convince, to enroll and persuade your colleagues into doing or being whatever you want them to do or be. And, um, you know, in, I think in most good organizations, your colleagues aren't automatons. They're not robots. You don't, you know, push this button and get this result. 
you have to deal with them as real people with likes and fears and angers and joys and know how to tap each of those to get the results you want. And some people call that politics. I don't think it is because it's, you, at the end of the day, you want to treat people like you want to be treated. You want to talk to people like you want to be talked to. You want to praise what you like publicly and then work on the things that need to be fixed privately. Because that's what you would want as, a, as an employee. Absolutely. And what you're, what you're really reflecting is that politics is not inherently good or bad. It is the nature of human relations. When we're interacting with another, we're engaged in politics. And so the degree to which we honor the other, our values are complementary to the other, we're engaged in positive politics, right? Is that another way to convey it? Yes, it's, it is the process of enrolling, engaging, and persuading people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's not necessarily any shame in that game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of us uh, may not know or choose not to acknowledge if we're aware we're engaged in that effort all the time, even if it's just with our family. And so the degree to which we're aware of it and acknowledge it and honor it, we can actually create better relationships within our organizations. Now, how, do, how can one imagine a path forward together, working with leaders who hold strong divergent beliefs uh, or rep represent constituent groups who are at odds with the constituents that you, for example, are, are representing? How, how can you bring, come together with someone who's uh, a detractor to you and move an agenda forward? Akin to one of, the best techniques, one of the best techniques for that is empathy, is mm -hmm. being able to place yourself in their shoes, even if it's something you completely 100% disagree with. Forcing yourself to go through the intellectual process of understanding what their self-interests are. What are they trying to accomplish? Who are their constituents? What will make those constituents happy? If you're in a negotiation, there's a term we learned in college called BATNA, the best alternative to no agreement. Mm -hmm. That's sort of your walkaway point. Mm -hmm. and you should know your BATNA as well as their BATNA, their, their place where they're just going to draw the line and say, no more. Um, and that comes out of empathy, out of being able to see and put yourself in their shoes and their positions. Um, again, you don't have to agree with it, but understanding it helps the process. It helps you validate what they need and also know um, what buttons you might be pushed, you might be pushing that may set them off on a tangent. And also understand. You know, what are the needs of their constituents? What, what do the people that are supporting them, the people mm -hmm. they have to answer to, what do they need? And so, you know, let's say you're negotiating um, uh, a new uh, staffing structure with the head of a union. Mm -hmm. And the head of the union uh, is there to protect his or her members of the union, to get them as best wages and benefits as they can, ensure working conditions. But you also know it's in their best interest that you as a company exist because mm -hmm. without it, their folks don't get paid. Mm -hmm. So going into a negotiation like that, um, you want to understand is what they need 10 more people on the staff or do they need the equivalent of that in salary or mm -hmm. is it because they need increase in union dues mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Um, the more you understand that, the better your conversations and the negotiation can be. But if you're so stuck on your own position and that's what you're, you, you're, you've focused, you've polished, you've really analyzed it, you may not get to the agreement you need to. Interesting. That That's powerful and an excellent example. I, I want to uh, give a shout out to some of the people who are here, Rochelle Lieberman, Tomoko Hao, uh, Stephen uh, Terzaki, uh, Randolph Bell, and Tomoko makes a statement, praise publicly, fix privately when we interact with individuals. Thoughts? Yeah, as, as we mentioned earlier, um, you know, the corollary to that is, of course, 
praise what you want to see more of. Hmm. All of us, especially if we're, we're smart and um, we are, we have keen judgment, we can see things and come to conclusions quickly. We also tend to be critical. I know I do. Uh, um, and we have to resist that urge, particularly publicly, even if we, our, our areas of criticism are spot on and can help the individual improve. But to do that in a private way, um, in a clear way, but not in a way that that's all they leave. That's all you leave. Um, people re will remember more than anything how you make them feel yeah. over the substance of what you say. So, yeah. you know, the the flip side, is, you know, it's it's like you know when you're you're dealing with family members. If there's something you want, ask for more of it and and praise them when you get it, and you'll get more of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, Tomoko echoed uh, your statement. Rogier Purnell uh, is online, Dr. Purnell, and she asked the qu question, what has the media gotten right in its coverage of the murder of George Floyd and subsequent protests? What could the industry, uh, or what could, how could the industry improve? Um, I think, Rogier, that's an open question. I don't know the answer to that yet. I think certainly at the fundamental level, the media is showing you the pictures. They're showing you the scenes. They're taking you to the streets. And that's something, if you're sitting in your house in Berkeley or Fremont or San Jose, um, you may not always be able to get out there and experience what's happening. The media, at least the, the national mainstream media, is also trying to explain the law and the context behind what's going on. But it's still an open question. That I think we'll have more clarity six months from now as, mm -hmm. as this, this dies down. But you know, the media gets bashed, but you wouldn't know most of what you know about the story if it wasn't for the media. Mm -hmm. We're the ones sending out, you know, I have friends and colleagues, uh, a former Bay Area uh, TV reporter at KTVU who's now been, been with CNN for the last six years, Sarah Seidner. I was texting Sarah the other day. She was right in the middle of all of the Minneapolis stuff. Mm. Um, uh, Oscar Jimenez, another CNN reporter who got arrested by the Minneapolis That's police, right. just doing his job. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know what's happening in Minneapolis, sitting in your house in Oakland, if it wasn't for those reporters and their camera crews and their producers and sound people and all the engineers that are getting that signal. You know, people don't realize they're shooting a camera on their shoulder, it's actually attached to a backpack. And in that backpack is about 25 cell phones, mm. the equivalent of cell, cell signals that are connected to create a data stream that can go right out from their backpack to the truck or back to the studio. Mm. And then that gets sent to DC or New York or Atlanta and then dist distributed all around the world. Mm -hmm. But you know, the technology and the main, maintaining of the technology alone is another group of very smart technical people that you never hear about, but they're also part of the media. So there's an infrastructure that exists of thousands of people and billions of dollars of technology that has been invested and put there so you can know what's happening in Minneapolis or New York City or Los Angeles or Oakland or Miami or Washington, D.C. I, I want to... I be a bit more personal for a moment. So you uh, were a journalist in Seattle, you were a journalist in Florida, you're a journalist here in California and, and San Jose with the Mercury News. You moved up the ranks. You did some things that were remarkable, uh, not just to me and people who care about you, but people who didn't know you. You were, you were making a difference. Uh, and yet you are a black man who were experiencing challenges like a lot of black men. What is it that you chose to lean on or to leverage in order to move through the challenges, the distresses, the um, the, the barriers, the factors that were in your way? You know, at the end of the day, you just have to be as good as you can at what you do. Aspire to be the best and, um, and keep pushing. Uh, early in my career, I said yes to lots and lots of things. I took on assignments. I stayed late. I came in early. I was the one that would pick up the weekend shifts, um, and because I knew I needed to get, you know, I needed to get some reps in. I needed to 
to do more journalism to get better at it. Um, you know, when I was in San Jose, I came there as a visual journalist in charge of the photography and uh, art and design departments. And um, but I knew I need if I wanted to become broader, particularly in leadership situations, I needed to get some more experience in, in other areas. So I was a system managing editor and gave it up, walked mm -hmm. away from that job and went back and became a straight up beat reporter covering mm -hmm. education, cops and courts. Um, and did that for almost a year and then became an assistant city editor to edit those reporters. And uh, I remember when I was reporting, remember when uh, Sonny Bono died up at Tahoe? Yes, yes. That was my story. I broke that. Mm. So I raced up there with Richard Wisdom, a photographer, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we got up there, ski patrol, got on the back of the snowmobile. The ski patrol took me to the spot on, on uh, the mountain where Sonny Bono died, there was still blood on the tree. He mm. walked, showed me the path that he came through. He was supposed to go this way, but instead went that way. Deep powder, mm. lost control. Um, and you know that's that's why, first of all, drones are important because you got to get there to see it. Uh, I remember when John Denver's experimental plane crashed off the co coast of Monterey. Mm. That was another story we broke. Um, but knowing how to, one of the great things about journalism is if you do it right, you have to be an expert on everything without mm -hmm. being an expert on anything. And that means you have to learn quickly how to learn quickly. So the mor that morning when I woke up, I knew nothing about experimental planes or John Denver's legacy. By mm -hmm. the end of the day, I, you know, this is pre-internet. Pre you couldn't just Google, um, but we were able with a, lot, with a library and, and lots of phone calls to pull together mm -hmm. enough of an understanding about the experimental plane that mm -hmm. he was using to convey to our readership and viewers what mm -hmm. happens. Um, and so as I talk to young people, it is uh, the, the best skill you have is learn how to learn quickly. I, I wanna also mention something else um, that, that's invaluable. There's a couple of questions here, uh, including from uh, our dear loved one, Christine Harris. Uh, she and I share your children as godparents uh, and aunties. So uh, before I ask that question, I want to just highlight something uh, about your leadership. You didn't have to, but you went to New Orleans uh, after that devastation occurred uh, in the midst of the devastation and you covered it. Can I, I want uh, people to have a sense of your uh, commitment to high quality journalism. Of course, you received many awards as a result of that. Um, I, 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 People are envious of those awards, but it wasn't about the awards. It was really about making certain that the lives of people are made transparent. And you can't do that remotely as you're talking about. So I want to go, before our time is up, I want to go to a couple of the questions. So I'm going to jump back to you, Tamuk, in a second. But uh, journalism, as Christine says, is just a subset of media content. Help people understand how to be more critical. Uh, the content that, of the content they take in, whether print or on cable or social media. For instance, what is journalism versus what is opinion? You want to speak to that a little bit? Oh, you're breaking up a little sure. bit. Sure. I actually, one of the classes I teach at Temple is uh, media and cultural uh, diversity. Right. Oh, I'm sorry about that. One of the classes that I teach is about how to be a critical viewer and, and uh, consumer of the media. Um, and that means that you have to be, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. As we learned in journalism school, if your mother says she loves you, get a second source. Um, <laughs> always ask the question when you read, someone sends you something on Facebook or, or you see something on Twitter, um, ask the question, how, how do you know? What's your source? How did you come to this information? Um, and then check out that source. And then ask that source, how do they know? Uh, you have to process. Okay. You have to prosecute. Uh, content and you have to be also look at 
where you're getting the content from. Um, you know, there are many reputable organizations, reputable media outlets, whether it's the San Jose Mercury News or San Francisco uh, Chronicle or CNN or Washington Post, New York Times, ABC. And there's a lot of junk out there too. And not, not all medium are created equal. And particularly in the age of the internet where, um, you know, Bubba's.com has the same footprint as CNN.com. Um, you've got to be able to distinguish, okay, who's actually got a reporter on the streets in Minneapolis versus someone who read something, who read something about something that someone forwarded to them. Go to core firsthand reporting. And then distinguishing between fact and opinion. Yep. The best yeah. opinion should be based on, on fact, but then they should amplify and add context and analysis and then offer the, the, the writer's uh, perspective. But it's an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, go back and look at the facts. Because mm -hmm. facts, facts are stubborn things. <laughs> um, they will reveal what's really going on um, if, if they are really facts. If they're not, then they may be squishy. Um, you know, that's why, in, for instance, in the case of uh, George Floyd, um, that really didn't resonate until people saw the videos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I wrote a piece for CNN uh, Digital over the weekend, and one of the lines I used in it, uh, Will Smith said, is that racism isn't getting worse, it's just getting recorded. Yes. Yeah. And the camera, these cell phones, have made it much easier and simpler to show what's been happening, particularly to black and brown people for generations. Mm -hmm. Now it's being recorded. Mm -hmm. And those facts are very stubborn. Now I know we have a delay. Um, and I wanna ask you Tomoko's question. Uh, she, it, it takes us back to an earlier conversation uh, or point. It seems like there are different companies who shy away from talking about what happened. Uh, in we Minneapolis. may be having a little lag. Yeah. And companies saying that they do not engage in politics and respect different perspectives. Okay. This seems to suppress many employees. What would you say to companies who need to understand the importance of diversity, inclusion, and equity initiatives? How so I hope that answers Christine's question. Yeah, I want to apologize, everyone, for the delay. Just so that you know, uh, Brian is coming from DC. So he's not on the West Coast. Uh, that, that, that's less the issue. It's more uh, the challenge with technology, which increasingly more and more of us are experiencing. Well, you know, and I, I had a conversation with a, a leader of a company on this topic yesterday. Diversity and inclusion should not be just an initiative. It shouldn't be something It shouldn't be something that's just stapled on to your other organizational policies. So can you hear me okay? Uh, you're delayed still. So we're, we're gonna receive what you already conveyed. And then regrettably to everyone who has other questions. We're getting a little bit of lag time. Yeah. Well, what I was gonna say is that um, diversity and inclusion should not just be an initiative. It should be ingrained into the culture culture of the organization.
organization. It should be just as important as turning a profit, as growing revenue, as maintaining expenses, as hiring. Um, and be, and that has to come from the top. It has to come from the CEO, the president, the board, board of directors. Uh, because otherwise, it'll be something you check off on the list. You have a, a diversity committee, and you do a couple of workshops, and you think, okay, got that done. Next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to apologize to the audience for the delay. Okay. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Yeah, we understand, but this is substantive. And um, we promised a half an hour show. We've gone over about a minute. And I want to thank you, Brian, sincerely for taking time out of your day. I know literally you're up as early as five or four in the morning and going until late at night um, covering key issues and making certain that your colleagues are on top of their game as you compliment them in the field, the industry we call media broadly, journalism in particular. And it's so important for us to pay attention. All right, Tina, I will uh, let you wrap, wrap it up. So like we're having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties. Yes, thank you again, Brian. And uh, notwithstanding the, the technical dis difficulties, I think it's important for us to recognize some of the things that Brian highlighted. Uh, the power of politics and in a, uh, engaging in a respectful way, listening, uh, being mindful, being uh, strategic, uh, and ensuring that what you have as an end goal can in fact be accomplished, even with individuals who you may be at odds with. And also the power of the media uh, to present to us information, unfiltered, and for us to do our own homework to uh, triangulate, to ensure that what we're receiving, not only is it factual, but it's presented in a way that allows us to make sound decisions. Uh, and in this time of the pandemic, in this time of the protest, in this time for real social economic change across this country, and I would argue easily across the planet, we have the opportunity to be the change that we envision. We first have to envision a change. And hopefully it's one where we understand our collective responsibility for one another. And without further ado, I wanna thank you for spending your time with us. Uh, we'll have our show. It's a weekly lead live show, lead standing for leadership, excellence and achievement on demand. We hope that we've inspired you at least a little bit to leverage the essence of who you are, which I firmly believe we all have genius within us, independent of where we're at on the planet. And to answer your question from my humble perspective, Alana Ross, who asked the question about uh, what can the media's role in keeping the heat on these companies do uh, to do the right thing in their companies rather than just throwing money at a cause with no internal accountability, I can't answer it from the standpoint of a media. I can answer from the standpoint of the rest of us uh, demanding that in a very respectful, responsible way, in our own ways, that organizations represent us and they do it in a way, and us meaning the collective us, Black folks, Latinos, Native Americans, Asians, Pacific Islanders, whites, folks I've not even mentioned, that the media represents all of our voices. And that's why I wanted to have Brian on because he so well has done that with different ethnic groups across, across this planet. And without further ado, thank you very much and look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. If your schedule permits, we'll have Julie Castro Abrams, Abrams another remarkable individual who's making a difference on behalf of the collective, the collective being all of us. Thank you.